Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in today's video, we'll be going through the 2023 physics exam multiple choice section. Like always guys, before I start this video, if you guys want private tutoring in specialist methods, physics or chemistry, you can always email me through this email. And here guys, let's smash through this video. Question one, one type of loudspeaker consists of a current carrying coil with a radial magnetic field, as shown in the diagram below, X and Y are magnetic poles, and the direction of the current I um, in the coil is clockwise. Mm, okay, the force F acting on the current carrying coil is directed into the page, which of the following statement correctly identifies the magnetic polarities of X and Y? Hmm, well, well, what we can just do actually is to just guess, because this, let's start off saying that Y is north and X is south, and just use your right hand um, slap rule and see if um, the force is directed into the page. If it is directed into the page, those are the polarities. So let's do that here. So of course, it's this is north and south, and hence your magnetic field will go to the right. And so using your right hand slap rule, your finger is going to go downwards where the current is, and your um, no, no, your sorry, your thumb is going to go downwards. Your fingers are going to go um, to the right where in the direction of the magnetic field, and your palm is actually currently right now it's out out of the page which is wrong in my one's out of the page we want it into the page so it must be the opposite hence this here should be a south and here this north so it goes like this and try it now so again your fingers are going to be on the left your thumb is going to go down and hence your palm should be into the page and yes it is into the page so um we can say that y is south and x is north which looks like a is your answer Nice. Question two. The diagram below shows two charges, Q1 and Q2, separated by a distance of D. There is a force F acting between the two charges. Which of the following is closest to the magnitude of the force acting between the two charges if both D and the charge of Q1 is halved? All right, so we know that the force is just K. Well, in this case, it's going to be um, you know, Q1, Q2, R squared. This is the force that's normally, uh, well, uh, sorry, D squared. That's the actual force, F. But now we've done some changes. So, so your force will be now K. Your Q1, we said we half it. So it's going to be Q over 2. So Q1 times Q2 over distance being also halved. So D over 2 squared. And so let's simplify this. We can write this part here as um, K Q1 2 all over 2. You can bring that 2 down because it's half. And this D squared and the other one's going to be 4. So that's just going to be um, simplifying that much more. We get D squared over 2. And that 2 can come to top. So we're going to get D squared and it's going to be a 2 in top. And so... What is it? Well, you just take that 2 out and K, Q1, Q2, D squared, which is what? You remember from this over here, it's the same as that. So that's going to be 2F. This we can replace with F. And hence, it's just going to be twice the force. When you half Q1 and also half the distance, we're going to get double the force. So C, that's your answer. Nice. Question 3. Space scientists want to place a satellite into a circular orbit where the gravitational field strength of Earth is half its, its value at the surface. So wait, let's have just draw a diagram here. So, okay, so let's just draw, okay, at the surface it's going to be G. And so, and we're taking another one where, we don't know the distance of course, but we want half of uh, the G value. Remember, in the surface is G, so we want a half, so G over 2. Um, yep. Which of the following expression best represents the altitude of this orbit above the Earth's surface where R is the radius of Earth? All right, so if this is R, your radius, we want to find this value of um, this distance right over here, from here to here. That's your altitude. And so the actual formula that you use here, this is the most common formula that you you want to write in your formula sheet um, is just this. So we know that G1 over G2 is equal to 
R2 over R1 squared. This formula is, I, I've be, you know, used this formula for any questions like this. I think in every exam, they kind of repeat these questions. And yeah, so this is the best formula to use. G1 is like, what is, uh, G1 and R1 are like, what is your initial, um, you know, statements? For example, we're, we're given the information that when the radius is R uh, and uh, our G value is going to be just G. And for the um, G2 is, for example, we're given G2. So this is your G2 and R2 is the radius, this here, which we don't know. And that's what we're going to calculate. So G1 in this case is just going to be G. Let me write it in a different color. So we're going to write G over G2, which is G over 2 um, is equal to R2, which is what we want to find. R1 is just big R squared. And so let's simplify that. That's just going to be, this over here is just going to simplify to 2. Because those G cancel out and yep. And so we're, it's just going to be um, mm -hmm. R squared, R squared. So you take the square root of both sides, we get root 2 is equal to R2, R. And multiply, so R2 is just going to be root 2, R. So your actual, this radius over here is just two t um, root 2 times this R value. And remember, we want the altitude, so um, which... You remember that this is what we have right now, and we want the altitude, which is only this part. So we're just going to minus r. We're going to minus this distance away from it. So we're going to minus r. So this over here now is our new. That's going to be our altitude. So root 2r minus r, which looks like c is the answer. Done. Question 4. Let's have a... The diagram below shows the force versus time graph of a force on a tennis ball when it's hit by a tennis racket. The tennis ball is stationary when the tennis racket first comes in contact with the ball. Which of the following is closest to the impulse experienced by the tennis ball as it's hit by the tennis racket? So we want the impulse. Now you should know when we have a force time graph, the impulse is actually the area. And because this is not a nice, you know, it is a smooth curve, we're going to just count the number of squares. So what's the first area of one square? So one square, the area is 50 times 0 0.01, which is 50 times 0 0.01, and that gives me 0 0.5. That's the impulse for one, um, you know, box of the area. So now we just need to start estimating how many boxes are under this graph. We have one, two, three, four. Let's say that's five, including um, this one over here. Five, um, five. So this one's six, seven, um, we'll say eight, nine, and including all these, it should be around 10, 10 to 11, around there. So we're going to say times that by 10. So that's 0 0.5 times 10 of these boxes, and that's going to give us our impulse, which is five, five newtons per second, which is B. Nice. So this is for question five and six. It says the diagram below show, shows a cir stationary circular coil of conducting wire connected to a low-resisting low globe in a uniform constant magnetic field. The magnetic field is switched off. Which of the four embeds describes the globe in the circuit before the magnetic field is switched off, during the time the magnetic field is being switched off, and after the magnetic field is switched off? So they've currently just placed it over here, and it was stationary there. Now, because there is no change in flux, remember, we need a change in flux. If there is no uh, a change in flux, we won't have any induced EMF. So in this case, it w you know, before, the actual globe would be off. But when they shut it off, when they shut it off at that second, there is a change in magnetic flux. And hence, it would have turned on. And after that, they've kept it constant. Like, they've just kept it there. It would have, um, there would be no change in flux. And hence, it will be, after that, it will be off. So, it has to be, so before, it has to be off. And during, when they switch it off, it's going to be on. And after, it's going to be also off, which looks like A. Easy. Question six, the radius of the coil is five centimeters and the magnetic field strength of 0 0.2 teslas, the coil has a, a hundred loops. Assume that the magnetic field is perpendicular to the area of the coil. Okay, that's good. Which of the following is closer to the magne magnitude of the magnetic flux through the coil of wire when the magnetic field is switched on? So we're given the radius. So if we have a coil with the radius, which is, um, in this case, it is... Um, 5 times 10 to the negative 2. Make sure it's in meters. And 
you remember the magnetic flux is just the area times your B value or your um, ma you know magnetic field strength. So our area in this case is what's the area of this circle? Now we know the area of a circle is pi r squared, and we know the radius, which is pi, uh, which is five times ten to the negative two squared, and so that's going to give me uh, five times ten to the negative two squared. That gives me zero point zero zero seven eight. So if that's our area, so 0 0.00785, and we're going to multiply it by our B value, which is just 0 0.2. So times it by 0 0.2, that gives me 0 0.015, uh, which looks like A is your answer. Done. Question 7. An oscill oscilloscope um, is connected to a sinusoidal AC voltage source. The resulting trace of the oscilloscope screen is shown below. One vertical division on this oscilloscope screen represents a potential difference of 20 volts. So one of these here over here is 20, that's going to be 40, and then hence this is going to be 60 volts. And one horizontal div uh, division represents a time interval of 10 milliseconds. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So this here... One um one period is actually just going to be forty milliseconds. So forty milliseconds. Which of the following is closest to both the peak to peak voltage and the frequency of the signal shown? Now, what do we know? This over here, this voltage here is called the peak voltage. The peak voltage, which is sixty in this case. We want to find the peak to peak, and you should know how to find that. Remember, if we have um. If we want to find the peak to peak, it's just the voltage times by 2. So the peak voltage times by 2, which in this case would be 120 volts, which looks like these are wrong. And how do we, we need to also find the frequency. So to find the frequency, we remember frequency is 1 over the period. So 1 over T, which is your period. Now we know the period in this case, it's just 40 milliseconds for one cycle. So 1 over 40 times 10 to the negative 3. Be careful, make sure it's in seconds. And that's going to give us, 40 times 10 to negative 3, 25 hertz, which looks like D is your answer. Let's look at question 8. At a swimming pool, um, Sharuk and Sam shown below steps off the low diving board at the same time. Over the small distance they fall, air resistance may be ignored. Sharuk and Sam have masses of 80 kilograms and 60 kilograms. So Sharuk has 80 kgs and 60 kgs. Which of the following best represents what happens to Shurek and Sam as they drop straight down into the water? Shurek reaches the surface first because she has a larger mass. Be careful here. This is not true. You need to remember that having a large mass is not like does not actually you know correspond that you know you would reach the surface first. That's what you might think. By using your formulas, you remember if both of them are starting at zero. You remember both of them. Start at u equals zero. They're both standing straight, and when she jumps, it's going to be a our acceleration is due to gravity, which is nine point eight. And so we let's say the distance for these is um two meters. So it'll be s is negative two your displacement, and let's find the time the time at which they land. As you can see here, over here, right over here. All this information both applies to both of them. So it means they will reach, the, like, they, it doesn't really depend on the mass. None of them, so, yeah. So even if this girl may be, like, 100 kilos, it really doesn't depend on mass when you're trying to calculate which one will land first. Both will land at the same time because both have the same acceleration due to gravity. And, yeah, so using your formula, your super formulas, there is nothing got to do with mass, so... Um, both of them will reach at the, that will land at the same time. So not that's wrong. B. The net force on Shurek is larger than the, than that of Sam. Uh, so Shurek reaches the surface first. Rubbish. Remember, they both land at the same time. But also, let's have a look at the net force. When they jump out, the actual force, the only force that's going to act on them is the force of gravity, which is um, F G equals M A uh, M G. Yep, the force of gravity, which actually does depend on mass. So in this case. Shurek will have a you know larger net force, but when you're this statement is true, but this part here does not make sense because remember they will both land at the same time. Have a look at C. They both reach the surface together, beautiful, because they both experience the same downward force. Rubbish. Be careful. Downward force. They both have actually different forces. Remember, F G equals M A. Um, that this one depends on mass. So. Uh, Shurek will actually have a larger net force, whereas this one will have a less um, net force. So it really doesn't depend on the force. 
That's rubbish. CD. They both reach the surface together because they both experience the same downwards acceleration. Yes, they do both, you know, experience the downwards acceleration of negative 9.8. So D is your answer. Nice. Question 9. An engineer is designing a bank circular curve of radius 25 meters in a new bicycle velodrome. Diagram A shows the bicycle approaching the bank section, and diagram B shows the front view of the bicycle moving out of the page as it rounds the uh, bank bend. The bicycle is traveling at 11 meters per second on the bank section. At this speed, there are no sideway frictional forces between the wheels and the road surface, whichever following is closest to the angle of bank bend. You should straight away know what formula to use here. It is one of this kind of question is very common in exams. And so use your formula for um, whenever you're dealing with bank, um, which is this over here. Tan theta is equal to V squared over RG. This is when you're, this, this formula is very important because it's, whenever you're dealing with bank question, this is one of the most, yeah, you need to have this in your formula sheet. And we want to find theta in this case, which is just going to be tan inverse of V squared, uh, which is what in this case? So what's our V squared? Well, we know our velocity is 11 squared, so 11 squared over the radius, which is 25, and G, which is 9.8. And putting this all in your calculator, we should get our angle. Uh, which is 11 squared, uh, 25, and 9.8. And putting that all together, that gives us 26.3 degrees, which looks like C is your answer. Nice. So this is for question 10 and 11. A force versus compression graph for a car spring is shown. Okay, which of the following is closer to the spring constant of the car spring? Easy. Remember, whenever you're giving a force compression graph, the gradient of it is the K value, your uh, spring constant. So we need to find that. Well, we know this is here, our point's always zero, zero. And this point over here is, make sure these are in meters. These are in millimeters here, and these are in kilonewtons. We have to make sure they are in newtons and meters. So this part here is, so eight, we can write it as 8 times 10 to the negative 3, which is now in uh, meters. And the uh, force, which is in kilonewtons, we can write it as 40 times 10 to the power of 3, and that's in newtons. And so I'm putting this all, um, so your K value is the gradient, which is 40 times 10 to the power of 3 minus 0, all divided by um, 8 times 10 to the power of negative 3 minus 0. So putting that in your formula sheet, we get... 40 times 10 to the power of 3, and 8 times 10 to the power of negative 3, which gives me, wow, it's a big number, but how many zeros? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We have, um, it will be 5 to the power of times 10 to the power of 6, so 5 times 10 to the power of 6 uh, from the air, so it has to be D. Nice, is that right? So 1, 2, how many, so how many decimals? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yep. Yeah to the power uh, 10 times 10 to the power of 6. Easy. Next question. When the car is sitting on a level surface, the car spring is compressed by 4 millimeters uh, from its natural length. So we're given the natural length. And of course, you know, when a car, um, it just the car itself, because it weighs so much, it will compress it by 4 millimeters. Okay, that's what it's shown. Car spring compressed. Okay. But as a car goes over a bump in the road, the car spring compresses an additional 4 millimeters from the initial compression of 4 millimeters. So the total compression is 8 millimeters. All right. Whichever following, whichever following is the closest to the additional potential energy stored in the car spring when the car goes over the pump. We want the additional potential energy. So let's have a look at this. Um, so we know that when it goes over a pump, it's going to get compressed by 8 millimeters, yeah? So SP, your spring potential energy is half K. What's our K value? Uh, we got it, which was 5.0 times 10 to the power of 6. Um, change in x squared, which in this case, um, when it's into a bump, it's going to be um, 8. It's going to be compressed by 8 times 10 to the negative 3 to make it into meters. Squared, and that's going to give us 5.0 5 times 10 to the power of 6. 8 times 10 to the power of negative 3 squared. So that gives us 160 joules of energy that it's compressed when it, it hits a bump. And so when it comes to normal, uh, what's the actual, when it gets, so, so imagine, wait, this is when it hits a bump, and this is how much it compresses and how much energy, but when it's traveling normally, which is only compressed by 4 millimeters, let's find that also, and we'll find the difference between these two, and that's going to give us the, the additional, four, additional potential energy that was, you know, stored. So also half, same K value, but the compression is 4 times 10 to the negative 3 squared, which 
keep just right here, right four, which is 40. So minusing D2, we get 120 joules. So 120 joules is the additional potential energy that was stored, so that was given. When, so remember, this is when it was traveling normally. So imagine a car, and it's already normally compressed by four millimeters. But when it hits a bump, it's um, it will give up. It will be this energy then. And so minus in this, this is the additional energy that was given. 120, which is looks like B. Done. Question 12. A physics class is investigating the dispersion of white light using a lens, as shown in the diagram below. Um, we can see this is a convex... Um, yeah, this is convex plane. The... Okay. The student observes the ray KP that have been refracted by the lens. Whichever following correctly identifies the color, green, uh, red, green, and violet, as the rays K and P. Um, all right. So remember, red has what? We know it has um, a very low frequency, meaning that it has a high... So we know red has a high wavelength. Uh, green has a medium, but violet is one of the strong... Uh, has a very strong frequency. Wait. Yeah, violet has a very strong frequency and hence is going to actually have a low uh, wavelength. Remember, the lower the... This is the main... Whenever you do questions, the lower the wavelength, the, the, the longer... The, the less the wavelength, so the lower the wavelength, the more it refracts. Now, because we know that violet has a very, very low in, in, in terms of, you know, red, green, and violet. Violet has a very low wavelength. It means it refracts the most. So let's have a look at the first part over here. So of course, we have two lights. So let's look at the first light here, this part over here. As it's going to go down, which one bends more? We can actually see what? The one that bends more is P, like here. This one bends a little bit. This one bends in the middle. But the most that one that bends is actually the P. So P has to be a violet. So a V. And let's also have a look at here. Which one bends the most when it's going like this? Well, this one bends all right, but the most one that bends is actually K here. So K has to also be violet. Um, so I'm going to put a violet here. Now, of course, um, let's see if that helps to check. So we know that K has to be violet, so that's wrong. And also the last part, which is P, also has to be violet. So which looks like also that's wrong. So we only get two considerations. Uh, of course, um, as we said, red in you know in terms of these colors, it has the highest wavelength, so it doesn't refract the most. So M, um, well, let's have a look at the first part here. We know the one that doesn't refract the most is N, so this has to be red, and also for this case, it has to be M here that doesn't refract. So let's have a look. So L, so for B it says L is G, yeah, because it's in the middle. So we said M is red. Okay, M is red here, and also N is red. Good. O is green. Yeah, so it looks like B is your answer in that one. Because this one's wrong. It's the, it's saying G. So, so it looks like B is your answer. Nice. Question 13. A physics student hears a clap of thunder shortly after observing a flash of light. Which of the following statements best describes the sound associated with the clap of thunder and the visible light associated with the flash of lightning? So it says, both the sound and the visible light are examples of transverse waves. No, sound wave is a longitudinal wave. Um... Yeah, so <laughs> that's rubbish, and light, you know, visible light is a transverse wave. Next one. Uh, both the sound and the visible light are example of longitudinal waves. Nope, not visible light. C, sound wave is an example of a transverse wave. Rubbish, it's a longitudinal. Sound wave is an example of longitudinal wave, and visible light is an example of a transverse wave. Beautiful, D is your answer. Question 14. Polarization of visible light provides evidence that electromagnetic radiation can be explained using what? So remember that polarization of light only occurs for transverse waves. Only for transverse waves. So let's have a look. Standing wave model? Nope. Transverse wave model? Beautiful, yes, because you remember? Um, polarization only occurs for transverse waves. Mechanical waves? Mechanical waves, including both longitudinal, doesn't work. Remember, longitudinal for polarization doesn't work, so... Uh, that's also wrong. C is wrong because remember mechanical includes both the um, also longitudinal, so no, and also longitudinal. Nope. So B is your answer. Nice and easy. Whenever okay, uh, uh, one of the best hints I always say, whenever you hear the word polarization, always remember only um, the word transverse. Normally, just that's the main thing. It, it's a transverse wave. Let's say if I look at question fifteen, two. Ambulances A and B are traveling along a straight road, both with the same constant velocity. Both the ambulances have their sirens on and the sound wave produced are identical and have a constant frequency. Ambulance A is traveling directly towards the stationary observer, while ambulance B is traveling directly away from that stationary observer, as shown in the diagram below. 
All right. Whichever following is closer to the frequency... Wait. Whichever following best describes the frequency of each siren as measured by the stationary observer compared to the frequency that the observer would measure if the ambulance were stationary. Now, that's very common. This over here is leaving. So he's, this frequency he's going to hear is going to be low for the ambulance, whereas this one's actually approaching him. So this he's going to hear a high frequency for ambulance A. And yeah, I mean, that's the kind of the most basic question. Let's have a look at the answers. The observer measures each siren's frequency to be lower. Nope. One's going to be higher. Um, the observer measures each siren's frequency to be higher. Nope. One's also going to, um, ambulance speed's going to be lower. C, the observer measures the frequency of ambulance A to be lower. No, it's actually higher, as we said. The observer measures the frequency of ambulance A siren to be higher and the frequency of ambulance B siren to be lower. Beautiful. B zero, uh, D zero answer. Question uh, 16. What are, so what are waves traveling at a constant speed and hitting a barrier can change the direction as shown in the diagram below? Sure, just having a look at this uh, picture, this image, you know it's diffraction. <laughs> Which of the following best identifies this phen phenomenon? Diffraction. Absolutely diffraction. So choose diffraction. This is the most common question. As you can see, um, there's a gap. Um, you can see that, yeah, it's diffracting. Resonance, rubbish. Remember, resonance is when you have like a frequency, the uh, natural frequency. So that's another thing. Refraction is when you change the direction of light. Nope. And dispersion is when you have like a like a prison and um, when you put a light and it disperses into uh, like a rainbow. So that's rubbish. Choose A. It's the most easiest question. <sighs> question. Is this the last part? Yep, last page. Question 17. Which of the following statements best explains why is it possible to compare X-rays and electron diffraction patterns? Let's have a look. Um, why is that? Remember, diffraction, just before we look at the answers, diffraction is a wave property. So both X-rays and electrons have wave properties. That's why they create a diffraction pattern. That's why it's possible. Let's have a look at A. X-rays can exhibit particle-like properties. Yes, it can, but that's not explaining why diffraction is occurring. Remember, diffraction is a wave property. B so that's wrong. B. Electrons can exhibit wave-like properties. Beautiful. Yes, electrons can exhibit wave properties, and that explains. C. Electrons are a form of high-energy X-rays. Rubbish. Electrons are not X-rays. No, they're not as a high thing. Yeah, high-energy X-rays. D. Both electrons and X-rays can ionize matter. Yes, they can ionize matter, but that's rubbish in explaining why... There's a diffraction pattern, so B. Question 18. Which of the following statements best describes the type of light produced from different types of light sources? Light from a laser is coherent, that is true, and has a very narrow wavelength. Yes, it does. B. Light from an incandescent light is coherent. No, from an incandescent light, it's very incoherent. Rubbish. C. Light from an incandescent light is incoherent, true, and has a very narrow range of wavelength. No, it has a very wide range of wavelength. D, light from a single color light emitting diode is coherent, that's true, and contains a very wide range of wavelength. Nope, it contains a very narrow wavelength. So yeah, this was nice and easy. Question nine. The diagram below shows the spectrum of light emitting by a hydrogen vapor lamp. The spectral lines indicated by the arrows on the diagram is in the visible spectrum of, you know, region of the spectrum. Which of the following is closest to the frequency of light corresponding to the spectral line indicated by the arrow? All right, so remember this is your wavelength, and as we can see, it's approximately around that 650. So your wavelength is 650 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. Remember, make sure it's in, in, it's in meters. And we want to just find the frequency. What formula does that give us? So the one that has frequency is frequency is equal to C over lambda, which is your wavelength. So yeah, your C value, that's easy. So, so you, what's your C? Well, you see, is of course um, 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8 divided by your lambda, which is 650 times 10 to the power of a negative 9. So put in that in our calculator. That gives me 4.6 times 10 to the power of 14. So 4.6 times 10 to the power of 14 looks like B is your answer. Last question. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle can be used to explain the results of a single slit diffraction experiment for electrons. This is because Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is fixed is the size range of the slit to be used. No, that's not what it does. Remember, Heisenberg's uncertainty, which is, um, so your change in x, your x position, and your momentum in the x direction must be greater or equal to h um, over 4 pi. So this actual 
thing over here tells us that we cannot simultaneously know the, both the position and the momentum of a um, like electron. That's what it's telling us. So that's rubbish. Sizes of the range states that each electron exact wait states that e that each e electron's exact position was predictable after passing through the slit. No, it doesn't predict it. It doesn't. See, states that each electron's actual position after passing through the slit was only known within a wide range. Yes, this is true. So I'll put a tick on that. What about the stats that if the electron's momentum was known, its position after passing through the slit was also known? No. If you knew the momentum, if you know the electron's momentum, it would be um you would have high uncertainty in the position. Um because remember, you can only know one and the other one becomes a very high uncertainty. If we know the position, we won't know the momentum because there will be more uncertainty in that momentum. So only C looks all right in that one. And yeah, that's it. I hope you learned something through this video. Make sure, you know, um, to watch other videos. Please make sure to like and subscribe and take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.